Israel, wherefore they may be likened unto you. Now what is that? Think about those two concepts. I'm going to tell you things which are, which would be present tense, things which are to come, future tense. So I'm going to talk to you about things now in time and space, and things outside of time and space in the future. And the reason that you can apply these present, these, here's what's even, one more thing, Isaiah's words come from the past, so what has Jacob just done? He's contextualized them. And, and he's contextualizing by stepping outside of space and time, implying that these words of Isaiah are written in such a way that they transcend space and time. How is that possible? Okay, think of physics here. This is fourth dimensional writing. How does anybody get in tune with fourth, fourth dimensional writing? How do you understand fourth dimensional writing? LSD. <laughs> right, I mean, seriously. What was it? He LSD. says LSD. That, no, I'm, I'm, jo I'm kind of joking, right? Because you're not supposed to do LSD. So what gets you in a place to understand somebody who can write outside of space and time? Way into the spirit. you got to be in the spirit. If you don't get into the Holy Spirit, guess what you're not going to get? The meaning. So Jacob is saying, hey, look, i got to get you to step outside of your, your like, physical body for a second here and comprehend that Isaiah has written something to you that applies to the past, present, and future. And if you are of the house of Israel, then guess what? It applies to you. But guess who Jacob's writing this to? Us. Us. Now... Now Jacob is talking to them for the sake of us, and he's using who to speak to them. Why would that be insulting to a Nephite? Jacob says, hey, I'm going to tell you about the Gentiles. Why would that be insulting to a Nephite? Hey, if I'm a Nephite, go ahead, sir. They've been scattered and um, like taken from their homeland, given a new land. And um, you mean the Gentiles or the Nephites? The Nephites. Okay, but they did so righteously, right? And the Gentiles had that happen to them because they were wicked. wicked. So you're going to compare me, a Nephite, to the wicked people? So I came. If I'm a Nephite, I came from Judea. And Judea was the capital kingdom of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they were bad. And I'm good now. That's why I got taken away. So you're not just comparing me to that level of bad. You're taking me one step further to really bad. Which is the Gentiles who weren't even worthy to be part of the southern kingdom of Judah. So you, can you imagine that a Nephite would be like, why are you speaking to me of Gentiles? We came here to avoid the condemnation of the Judeans and the Gentiles. And now you're not just talking to me about the Gentiles, you're talking about, to me about the future state of the, the Gentiles telling me they are a blessing if they will repent and fight not against Zion. So now where are we at in time and space? Jacob is taking us to our day. He's talking about us right now saying that there will come a moment in the future time of the Gentiles, which is us, where if we see, right, the, these secret combinations rise up and take over our nation, who want to stop the rise of Zion, and if we join those secret combinations, then we're going to be in trouble with the Lord. Look what he says here. Why did they write this? Why did Isaiah write this? For us. So he's even saying, look, Isaiah wrote this for you right here. Not you imagining you're a Nephite. A time when the Messiah will set himself again the second time to recover them. And they that believe not in him. Okay, who's they? The Gentiles. The Gentiles that believe not in Christ shall be destroyed by 
Fire. Are you seeing a, a common theme now? We've been in this place like four different times. This moment of fire, tempest, earthquake, bloodshed, pestilence, famine, wars, commotion, hearts failing, nations rising against nations. Right here we are yet again. And this time we're with Jacob, and Jacob is taking us here in our day. And what's ironic about this moment if you're a Nephite sitting in front of Jacob? Ask the question. Okay, what's, what's ironic? If you're a Nephite sitting in front of Jacob, what's ironic about him using us to describe this situation? I'm going to take you there right now. That's it right there. That's ironic. Jacob didn't need to use us, did he? Because the best example you could possibly think of in all Scripture of people who get destroyed in this way are who? The Nephites. But Jacob doesn't use them. Now let's look at how weird this is. Okay, this is, this is odd. Because Jacob has this amazing prophetic example. Jacob says that he has seen Christ. Nephi says that the Lord has shown Nephi the destruction of his people. He has communicated this to Jacob. So Nephi and Jacob know that in about 34 AD, a storm will arise uh, so bad that nobody's ever seen anything like it. It will shake the earth. Um, it will cause these sharp lightnings. It will cause Zarahemla to be burned with fire. Notice what he says here. He doesn't just say Zarahemla burned with fire. He says what? Yeah. Yeah. And I killed all the people. Just think about what the Lord is saying there. He's not just saying I destroyed the city. He's taking ownership of something worse, human life. I've caused Moroni to be sunk into the depths of the sea and drowned the people, covered Moroni hot with earth and the inhabitants, the city of Gilgal I sunk, the city of Onihah, Mokum, Jerusalem, he caused waters to come up in the stead thereof. And then look at what he says. Would, would that support why we've been frustrated with our geography of trying to find where all this is? And, and not only that, you go to 4th Nephi 1 and you get no geography thereafter. Mm -hmm. and, and a reclassification of what's a Lamanite and what's a Nephite in 4th Nephi 1. So now look at what he says as a result of this. As a result of all the destruction described in 3rd Nephi 8, 9, and 10, Mormon then says, Whoso readeth, let him understand. He that hath the scriptures, let him search them. See and behold, if all these deaths are not unto the fulfilling of the prophecies. Okay, now, I know this is a lot, right? But go back now to this. He's talking to a group of Nephites, and he's talking about us. He says that a bunch of us in our day are going to be destroyed in the same way he describes right here. But he doesn't use this example. What does that tell you? When you in a literary, uh, when, when you use literary methodologies, what's a good word for that? If, I, if I'm writing, what examples do I want to pull from when I write? The best or the second best? Definitely the best. The best. So Jacob is using the best example of destruction. It's going to be worse. It's going to be worse. <laughs> it's got to be the maximum. That's right. And, and we have this, and just, as, just as Mormon said, we have this in front of us. And when it happens to us, Mormon is saying this to us. He's saying, look, when it happens to you, you'll have no excuse because it will be unto the fulfilling of the prophecies that you have in front of you. They're all right there in front of us. Second Nephi 6, we've had it for how long now? Almost Can you go back one slide? Sure. Oh, the other way. All right. Maybe, no. Yeah. Hey, yes. Okay. Last sentence in that paragraph. Yeah. And they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. It's, it's almost like he's saying... And they that believe not in him shall be destroyed both by fire, tempest, and earthquakes, bloodshed, and by pestilence right. and famine. But they still said they knew the Lord was God. Is, is that in the same context of that sentence? 
Maybe. I'll, I'll propose this in two different ways. I, I'm, what's your name? You might want to plug your ears. Your mom won't like me telling you this. Mom. I love video games. You see what my mom would want me to say? That? I love video games. I always have, probably always will. If you stuck me in a cave with like a computer and video games and pizza, I'd be happy. And so, have you ever played a last man standing game? Yeah, that's super fun, right? I'm, Fortnite is basically a team last man standing. Okay, what, I'm, I won't go into them all. My kid, anyway, never mind, stop. Uh, the, the whole concept of, of these modern video games, that are a lot of them are last man standing games. Well, what's the, where do we get that notion from? Where do we get the concept of last man standing? Who is the last man standing? We are. We want to be the last man. I agree, but we don't have the power to be. So inevitably, what will happen to all of us? We will die. And no matter how much you don't want to die, no matter how much you want to be the strongest person of all the people on earth and have the most money, there's always going to be somebody stronger with more money, and ultimately that person's going to die too. There's only one person who has power over life and death. And that's the last man standing. And in the day in which you die and can do nothing about it, you will look to him for life because he is the only person who can do it. And that's the point. That's the point of everything we're doing and everything we're going through is not to prove that he is. It's to prove to us that he is. Does that make sense? It's a fundamentally different equation than thinking that we're here to prove that he is the one. That's not why we're here. He's the one whether we accept it or not. And I think that's what Jacob is saying, is there will come a day when you're dead and you will realize you have no power to overcome that death. And as you seek for a way to overcome it, there is only one being in all of the universe who can do anything about that. And you can choose to call out to him or not. But the result will be the same either way. <coughs> okay, so, so the moral of the story, right, if, and, and I, could, I could keep going down that path and I won't for the sake of time. Watch ye therefore that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Now remember there's those three chapters, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where the Lord goes through the entire thing. He says this is what's going to happen. And, and what I hear is, I even saw it, I, I saw it yesterday. I was watching a video, really, I really enjoyed this guy's channel, actually. A very knowledgeable scriptorian, very good uh, YouTube channel. But for some reason, he felt to be antagonistic towards all the people fascinated by the eclipses that are happening. And people are taking these eclipses in 2017 and the one in Utah and the one in 2024, and they're assigning a lot of meaning to them. And he was like, well, is that legitimate? I was like, well, you know, I mean, I get that, but does it matter? <laughs> Isn't it good for people to be looking up into the heavens and waking up a little bit? And the Lord himself even says, you better be watching. And, and that part of what, what that does to you by watching and being prepared is it, it makes you worthy for some reason, right? It makes you worthy to stand before the Lord. Now, here's one more admonition I want to show you from Peter. Remember, this is the guy. This is the Lord's right-hand man. Imagine <laughs> if you go to Peter, you actually have a chance to talk to him. And, and this is what he's addressing in this chapter. He's addressing advice relative to the second coming. So he's talking about the second coming, and he says, here's my one piece of advice for you. If I can give one, one piece of advice relative to the second coming, this is it. Now look at that, and tell me that if that's not the worst piece of advice you've ever seen. <laughs> because what does that mean? Now, how awesome would this advice be if you knew when to start counting from? 
Now, all of a sudden, that becomes really good advice. And here's what's interesting about that advice is you already kind of have the answer within you. You know what year this is. <coughs> Roughly, give me, give me a rough guess what year Peter is saying this in. It's after Christ's death. 45, 60. Yeah. No, probably no sooner than 20, or no sooner than 35 AD, no later than 60. Okay? All right, well, LDS theology, how many years do we have on this earth? Total for the earth. Temporal time frame. 7,000, 6,000 years, right? 6,000 temporal, 1,000 years paradisiacal. So how hard is that to figure out now? How many of those passed before Christ? <coughs> we, can, we can fairly accurately assess that there were about 4,000 years of recorded history, of recorded agricultural history prior to the birth of Christ. Okay, so add 2,000 to that. Peter says one day, how many days we got to get through before the millennium hits? A two. This is the other thing that hit me in 2020. If you're LDS, you got some explaining to do. You don't have much time left before you're wrong. You see why? LDS theology says 6,000 years and then a millennium is going to happen. 6,000 years is up. Am I wrong? So now what do we have to do with our narrative if Jesus doesn't show up in the next little bit? We've got to change the symbolic meaning of the 6,000 years. You ready to do that? I, I didn't know how to do that. I don't know how you go back and say, well, hold on a sec. We didn't really mean 6,000 years, right? What did we mean? So you can, you can pretty accurately assess that, that 6,000 years has expired, and it's time for Christians across the world to own the doctrine of the second coming. Either that, or you've got to revise the way we've presented it for the past 1,000 years. Okay, so... Christ, this is John 4. Christ goes to Judea, or sorry, he leaves Judah, he goes to Galilee, he goes through Samaria, and comes to a city called Sychar. Now, Sychar in Hebrew means the drunkard, and the parcel of ground is the well given to Jacob. Okay? Um, or sorry, that, that Jacob gave to Joseph. Now, why would that be important to most LDS people today? Because we're descendants of Joseph. Okay, because we claim the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. And so who is the Lord probably talking to if this is not meant to be historically informative, but maybe instead is a parable? This would be for the, for the modern day descendants of Joseph. And so this story appears to be directed precisely at you, telling the latter day posterity of Jacob that this is of some significance to us. Samaria as well, when you look at the Hebrew, is Shemaria. Shem is Sam. Ar is the city. Aria, have you ever heard of Aria, the city of David? It's just Shem Aria. Instead of David Aria, this is Shem Aria, the city of Shem. Shem being the birthright son of Noah, who was also called Melchizedek. So there's something really important about this place. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain, so Samaria, nor Jerusalem worship the Father. What's he saying there? There's going to come a day where the center of religion is no longer Samaria and Jerusalem. How many of you have been seeing this stuff about the red heifer? I, I do, uh, no offense, I do not understand why anybody on this side of the world would care one whit about that. Now, I can see if you care about it politically, right? But why religiously do we find significance in that event at all? It's another sign of the times. Okay, how? 
I can't explain things very well, but it's to purify the priests to build the temple that needs to be built in Jerusalem. Okay, so now let's follow through on that. Let's... Go ahead. I don't know anything, but if, and it's I haven't looked into it that much, so here's my guess. Um, when the sons of Aaron offer sacrifice again. Okay, so let me ask you this. Who can build temples with the keys? Bites. With keys. Is our church in the process of building the third temple in Jerusalem? Already has. Okay, explain that to me. I think it's the uh, Jerusalem. The BYU Center. Yeah, okay, BYU. so they, uh, if I understand it correctly, they're not allowed to perform any ordinances in the Jerusalem Center. But it has two baptismal fonts, I just heard recently. Okay. Well, they do the sacrament there. Okay, let me show you one more thing. <laughs> okay, you've all seen this before. <clears throat> I can't elaborate on this, okay, but I'll try and hint at it enough for you to get the picture. Okay, you've seen this, right? Mm -hmm. Notice it doesn't say Aaronic Priesthood. It says Priesthood of Aaron. I don't know if that means anything, I just want to point that out. This shall never be taken from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. Okay, and what we do is we say, well, that hasn't happened. Except that if you go to the temple, you will notice something in this regard missing. And I can't really say more than that. Wait a second. You need to tell me where your eyes I can't see. It's uh, D&C 13. Okay. Verse 1. There's only one verse. <laughs> Something has happened in our temples that directly correlates with this. Now let's move on. Let's go to D&C 128. Joseph Smith received a revelation from the Lord. Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand, and who can abide? The day of his coming, who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them. So let's, let's uh, if, if you want to make the argument the sons of Levi are over there, who has to purge and purify them? Jesus Christ. The Lord. When does he come to them? Not of all this, okay? That they, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Let us therefore as a church and a people and as Latter-day Saints offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness and let us present in his holy temple when it is finished a book containing the records of our dead which shall be worthy of all acceptation. Okay, now, what is that? That is awesome. What has that happened already? Does anybody remember in about 2000 when the church with superhero effort increased the work for the dead in the temples through what means? Internet. What's that? The internet. The internet. I have a friend who was on the church team. Elder Iron was assigned to head up that project and he said he's never worked on anything where he saw an apostle with so much urgency as Elder Iron had for increasing the work for the dead through electronic and internet means. By 2020, what had we done with that project? Anybody remember that time frame? What happens to the work in the temples? Between so what they were doing, um, what's it? Yeah. 2020. Between 2000 and 2020, what happens? Family search. Huge numbers are now yeah. being submitted digitally. You could go to the temple and they'd be like, would you do... All of these. And then they say, we need the youth in the temple. And so the, two, the youth start going to the temple. And then they reach out to the states and they're like, we need a thousand, two thousand names from your stake in this amount of time. And so all the states start doing these challenges and we start having massive amounts of work. And then what happens in 2020? COVID. COVID. Now, I don't know this, right? I, and this is all anecdotal. 
Do you remember the work ever picking up again after that to the same degree as before? It's about to. Okay, that, that, that could... <laughs> we are building massive... Okay, now, here's why I think this is important. Let's go out here. <coughs> Revelation. Okay, remember what, remember what the Lord says in DNC 128? Joseph says, let's prepare a record worthy of all acceptation. Let's present it to the Lord. seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets and another angel this is a different one of the seven came, besides the seven came and stood at the altar where would the altar be? in the temple and there was given unto this angel incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints where do you get those? prayers prayers of the temple which was before the throne. And the smoke came in. Why would you have to do this? Why, why does this have to be done? What, what is this? Let's, let's try to actually break this down to something more than just the symbolic image. Okay? If, if we say, well, how do prayers of saints get offered on altars? You just imagine that right now. You know how that happens. It's a very practical day-to-day -day thing that goes on in the temples all the time. And why would we need to do all of that work? What's the purpose of all of that work? In the, the Joseph is in his room and Moroni shows up. Pur and purification. Purification. Is to sanctify the generations together. To bind them. It's to turn it if we don't. the hearts of the children of the fathers, the fathers of the fathers of children, because if this doesn't happen, the whole earth will be okay. utterly wasted. So imagine this is the moment. This is the moment where the offering talked about in DNC 128 is taken up to the Lord. The angels come down. They, they, they look at what we have done, and they're reporting back to the Lord to say they've done it or they have not done it. Now think 2000 to 2020 temple work. See why the brethren would have some urgency? Did they know the temples were going to be closed? Did they know COVID was going to happen? Did they know in 2000 to 2004 that President... Nelson would get up in 2019 and say, this is the hinge point, things are going to change. I, I think the Lord knew. So, so what are they doing here? Is this the moment where if it hasn't happened, the Lord says, no, burn it. And the whole earth is utterly wasted, right? So this is a really important moment. Now, once this offering is made, the prayers of the saints ascend up before God, the angel takes the censer, fills it with fire, casts it to the earth, and there are voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Now that sounds a little bit similar to the tribulations we were just reading about. This preaching of sermons that starts once the offering is made. And then the first angel sounds. Now, now the offering is made. It's time to start the tribulations. And the first angel sends fire and blood and burns a third part of the trees. Okay, that happened. Now, I'm not saying that, that happened. Okay? I actually think that there are things that when the Lord comes, they'll all kind of happen at once in a really short window of time. And then there's things that happen before that to warn us that that is upon us. Okay, so do we see a point in time where a third of the trees burn? Australia 2020, Canada 2020, the United States in 2021, the U.S. Forest Reserve burns. California. California. Okay, what's the second one? Third part of the sea. Third, third part of the rivers. Okay, so, so what, is that, what does that mean? I, I think that, I think that the... Sometimes when we look across the ocean to watch what is going on over there, we miss that all sorts of things have to happen here first before anything 
happens over there of significance relative to the second coming. Now, that doesn't mean things aren't happening regularly, right? But, but we, we have been given an observatory of sorts. Okay, so when you want to monitor the stars, you put up an observatory. And where is the Lord's capital city today? Salt Lake. Salt Lake City, Utah. Maybe, maybe you're Catholic and it's Rome, right? But we LDS people disagree with it. It's Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's not Salt Lake City because Salt Lake City is special. And it's not Salt Lake City because the people are special. They become special by doing what? actually functioning as the observatory. If they refuse to do that, then it doesn't work. So the Lord says to the woman, there will come a day when you will not worship in this mountain, i.e. Samaria, nor Jerusalem. Well, where will they worship? Well, you're seeing it today. Where are we building temples? Okay, now, notice what they say to him. When the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Okay, what Peter saying? When is this happening? Who is he with at this moment? What do we call these people in the Bible at this time? The Gentiles. The Gentiles, the northern kingdom. Okay? So he's basically saying he's spending two days with the northern kingdom. You ever heard the concept of fullness of the times of the Gentiles? How many days do the Gentiles get? Two days. What's Peter say? This is approximately 30 to 31 AD. Would it surprise you at all? I'm not saying it will, okay? Would it surprise you if the days of the Gentiles were over completely in 2030 to 2031? Exactly as this parable seems to indicate. Okay, what happens when the times of the Gentiles... Now, it could be sooner than that, right? What happens when the times of the Gentiles end? Close. Close. There's a, pre, there's a condition precedent. The, the, the fullness of the gospel transfers from the Gentiles to the... House of Israel. Okay? And who are the Jews? A part of... The house of Israel. What's President Nelson just said? The most important work going on on the earth right now is gathering. the gathering of the house of Israel. Okay, again, when you look at President Nelson's statements, you can fit them into an argument that we're really close to the second coming. All right, now the Lord, the Lord actually gave us a pattern. And I would propose to you that the road to Emmaus is in and of itself a parable. The road or the walk is about seven miles long. It is undertaken with two disciples, one of whom is named. His name is Cleo Cleopas. His, the meaning of his name is the vision of glory or celebration of the Father. <laughs> the Lord comes upon these two disciples in disguise. They don't recognize him. And they're talking about the events that have recently transpired in Jerusalem, one of which is the death of Christ. And Cleopas says to the Lord, before he recognizes him, he says, don't you know that Christ was condemned to death? He's been crucified. He was supposed to redeem us. It's the third day. And I love this part where he says certain women. There's these women saying that he's risen right? because they're the first ones to see him. And now the guys aren't sure they believe the women who are claiming that he is risen. So these guys are really disturbed. These women say they saw angels, they say he's alive, and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. I don't even know if I should reflect on. Anyway, I won't. But you can't say that. Well, it's like, why do the women see him? Why the first witnesses are the women? I think it's because the men were in hiding, weren't they? Yeah, it could be. I, I do find it interesting, though, that they say. Um, the men 
say that what the women say is true, but they didn't see him. So these guys are like basically saying, we're not sure what to believe. And the Lord says, oh fools, and slow of heart. Now imagine that. Imagine the Lord comes upon you and he calls you a fool. <laughs> slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So even if you don't want to believe the women who have witnessed this, you should know it already. Why? Because it's written. And, and the, then the Lord gives the pattern. Look at the pattern. So as this was for the first coming, so it is for the second. If you want to know when he will come, follow this pattern. Start with Moses. And go through all the prophets, and they will expound all things concerning the Lord. Okay, now I'm going to show you this real quick, and I'm going to try and speed this up, because I'm taking too long. President Nelson says in April 2020, we live in the last dispensation when nothing shall be withheld. He footnotes that with footnote 3, which goes to DNC 121-28, a time in which nothing shall be withheld, whether there be one God or many, all thrones, dominions, principalities, upon who? Who gets to know all this? Those who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He'll reveal the times, revolutions, appointed days, months, years, set times shall be revealed. According to that which was ordained, He'll give everything from the beginning to the end. Now we know this scripture very well. It's scripture mastery. We learn it on the missions. We learn it in seminary. Okay, and we, we take this and we say this means follow the prophet. And it does. But it means way more than that. Daniel says something similar. That God will reveal secrets and make it the known Revelation 10 says the mystery of God should be finished when? Tells us exactly when. The voice of the seventh angel. Notice how similar that is to Amos 3 7. The mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets in the voice of the seventh angel. What is the mystery? The mystery, according to Paul, is actually Christ's literal appearance. So let's see if we can figure that out and follow the advice of the Lord. Look at 3 Nephi 21. It is wisdom in the Father that the Gentiles should be established in this land. What land? This land. Mesoamerica. I'm joking. <laughs> okay, we would never say that. So where is this happening? Who, who's speaking right here? It's 3 Nephi 21. It's the Lord talking. Who's he talking to? Canadians? <laughs> to, is he talking in Brazil? Right? Now you can argue, well, he means all of it. Okay. All right. I, I think that's, that's a stretch, but, but okay. I'm not, I'm not here to resolve the Mesoamerican homeland conflict. But look what he also says. As a free people. Yeah, as a free people. This land is a free people. Where'd that happen? And what power is that? What do you mean the power of the Father? They didn't have priesthood. But what, what else would you call them? You stretch your head a little bit. What's going on here? How can you say that? Because the priesthood wasn't restored until after 1820. So what priesthood or, or power is that? What is the church in scripture? Church in metaphor is always a woman. It's a woman. Church is always a woman in the scriptures. Is a woman in a Christian nation expected to fight for her family? No. Who is? A Judeo-Christian man does not send his wife out to fight for him. He does not send his daughters to war. Who does he send? Himself and his sons. So what do you need before the woman can be protected and safe? You need the men to use their patriarchal priesthood to establish a place that is safe for the woman to reside. And so the founding fathers are called upon to lay the foundation of a nation 
where the woman can be protected and honored. And so the Lord raises up a patriarchal group of men to establish a patriarchal order so that the woman can now become what she is intended to be. And what do we do? Yeah, hold that thought. Nephi sees this, and it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the Gentiles who had gone forth out of captivity to humble themselves before the Lord, and the power of the Lord was with them. Yeah, does that happen? Yeah, 1620. Okay, now, oh, I thought I had it. Hold on. Yeah, no, shoot, I put it, put it in the wrong place. Yeah, let's, let's not do that. Let's do this. Look at Deuteronomy 29. I thought I had it there. I don't. I apologize. Okay, Deuteronomy 29. Maybe. Who's the, who's the, look at the first verse. These are the words of the covenant. Who's the covenant being given to? To Moses. Who's the Lord talking to through Moses? You stand this day, all of you, before your God. Captains of your tribes, your elders, your officers, your wives, your children, strangers in the land. For what purpose? To make a covenant with the Lord, and look who it applies to the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Okay, so the, the covenant given to Moses is not a covenant given in one single space and time. It is an eternal covenant given to all the posterity of the house of Israel. Why would that matter? Because the Lord knows the house of Israel will fall, and they do, multiple times. To the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, to the Romans, till finally they're scattered and they go into a state of apostasy. The Lord sees this, and he says, there will come a day when who will call them to mind? The posterity of the house of Israel. In the nations where the Lord has driven them. Okay, does that happen? When does that occur? Anybody, I was talking about Saint, I'm going to get it wrong now. Now I'm not going to know how to pronounce that city, Saint Augustine. Did I say it right? Yeah. Saint Augustine. Who settles that area? Florida, it's the first city in America. <clears throat> oh, settled by European colonists, settled by the Spanish. Do they hold it? For a Why while. not? They don't. For a little while, then they're displaced by who? The posterity of the English colonists okay. who come over in 1620. What did the colonists do differently in 1620 than the Spanish colonists do? They literally will not get off the boat until they sign that thing. A covenant with God. Exactly what is required to inherit a promised land from God, and the Spanish don't do it. But they do in 1620. As a result, the Lord says, if you'll call the covenant to mind, then he will do what? He will turn your captivity and return and gather you. Okay, so let's go back and take a look. Does the Lord fulfill the covenant? Does he deliver them out of captivity? Yes. Does he return and gather them? Look at the date. 1620, 1820, 2020. What would you expect to happen at these 200 year anniversaries? First one, they make the covenant, 1620. Second one, he fulfills. What's his next promise to the Gentiles? <coughs> if you join the secret combination, I'll come again and destroy you. <laughs> what did we do in 2020? We entered into a worldwide secret combination to take away your First Amendment rights. We closed all churches and all temples and forced children in schools 
who had a literal 0% fatality rate to subject themselves to a martial law government in the modern southern kingdom of Judah and the modern northern kingdom of Israel, which is America. I know. And, like, that's just the... I mean, there's freedom of speech in the First Amendment, but there's also freedom of assembly, which was not so... Like, there was an attempt to take any kind of assembly down to ten people. If you can't assemble, then you can't... Most people, do, most people do not go there. Not only that, we have a freedom of petition for redress of grievances, and you lost that in 2020. As a lawyer, I uniquely saw that in the inability of clients to get jury trials in 2020 because of COVID, and the inability to consider yourself as if, uh, what's the best way to put it? Um, we basically started, started to treat all prisoners like domestic terrorists. You could be detained without your traditional rights of due process under the Constitution in 2020. All of those are part of the First Amendment and rights of due process. Okay, um, I'm not going to do that. Now, so, 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 I do want you to see this real quick though. Think about this from the perspective of what the Lord says on the road to Emmaus. He says, start with Moses. Does Moses lay out a precise timeline? And he may not get super specific, but he gives you the exact order. I will scatter you among all nations. Some of you will remember the covenant. Some of you will undertake to do the covenant. If you do, I'll, I'll liberate you. I'll, give you. I'll free you from your captivity, and then I'll return and gather you. Moses predicted the exact order of the restoration of the church. Now, that could just be Joseph Smith's genius, right? Joseph's just a really smart guy who's like, oh, I see what's got to happen here. And, and he's like, okay, got the pilgrims, check. Got the founding fathers, check. Okay, here's what I got to do next. And Joseph does it. Just lays it out in the right order, right? So what do you do next if you're Joseph? You got to get the next part right. Where would you go to get the next part right? See, here's a challenge to our ability to test Joseph's prophetic standing. It should be really easy for us, right? Because we're all born and raised, or we've been in long enough, so we can just call to mind immediately, where should Joseph go next if he's, gonna, if he's a charlatan and he wants to do it right? We have no idea, right? No idea. But, but a 14-year-old kid, he, he, he got it, and he knew exactly where to go. And, and it wasn't enough for Joseph to orchestrate a restoration. He had to get it right in the order. Because there's this grand prophetic timeline going on here that the Lord hints at in the road to Emmaus. So here's where you got to go next. If you're Joseph, in 1820, you got to claim that you saw the Lord. And next, you've got to take Scripture... And you've got to fulfill Scripture. So, if Joseph has read this, Joseph knows that the woman is the church. He's got to clothe the woman as Moses clothed Aaron and his sons in the tabernacle. He's got to restore the authority of the woman, the twelve apostles. Right? Now, interestingly, this sign is the sign of Virgo. And Virgo has only manifested herself in the skies in this form twice in the last 400 years. The first time Virgo did this, she appeared in what are called the grand planets of the Maseroth. That's the Jewish word for the zodiac before it was turned into witchcraft. It's God's scriptures in space. And what happens is in September of 1827, Virgo appears in the sky with the Leo and some other planets of the Maseroth that, that are part of the Hebrew Maseroth. And, and she appears up in the heavens and she's got the sun at her shoulder, the moon at her feet, and she has a planet in her belly called Zedek or Jupiter. The Hebrew name for Jupiter is Zedek, as in Melchizedek. So this actually happens in September of 1827. It happens again in September of 2017. 
Now, what's interesting about that is in 2017, when it happened, a bunch of Christians became aware of this. And they all started saying, hey, this is Revelation chapter 12. Jesus is coming. So the, the Catholic Church cannot be outdone, right? And the Catholic Church has a really interesting relationship with the United States. Do you know why? I went to a Catholic law school. One of my professors was Judge Bork. Another one was a guy named... Uh, Bruce Fronin, who wrote a book called The American Republic, and they have this really interesting relationship with America because they love it, and yet they can't love it completely. Because if God is doing the work in America, what does that say about Rome? <laughs> See the problem? And they recognize this as Catholics. They, they, they recognize this problem. <coughs> so this Catholic astronomer in 2017, 2018, gets online and he says, this is not what you think it is. I'm the uh, Catholic astronomer that works at the Vatican Observatory, and this has happened before. It happened on September 22nd of 1827. Hmm. And if you're LDS, you should be like, but I'm <laughs> Because that's when Joseph says he got the gold plates. So here's Joseph doing what? Joseph is picking the exact right date to get the plates. Perfect, perfect date. And then within three years, Joseph does what? Just as predicted. He founds a church with 12 apostles in April of 1830. So far, he's batting a thousand. Right? It's amazing. And then Joseph is like, and this is not it. We've got to restore the fullness, which means the kingdom of God. Now, he doesn't do that yet. But Joseph starts to lay out plans for the fullness of the restoration of the gospel, including the kingdom of God. And so what, what does the church have to become? Pregnant, this woman in travail, and she's pregnant with the kingdom of God. And now we get what? And I, I mean, this, this is actually so amazing. I, I wish I had more time to go into this, but Joseph is born in 1805. And 13 years later, in 1818, <coughs> Karl Marx is born. Joseph is this unique American Christian prophet in the West, and Karl Marx is this unique humanistic, communist prophet of the East. And while Joseph is over here in the West, in like supposedly inventing this new golden book and a restoration of the gospel, and he's talking about freedom and liberty and all these, you know, kind of at the time very liberal concepts, bringing back the temple and creating a Zion community that's not communist, right? And over here you've got Karl Marx, who shortly after Joseph kind of rises to prominence, Karl Marx starts to rise to prominence. Just like Joseph, he's an editor, he's a writer, he's kind of a prophet. But, but on the Eastern you know, side, Karl Marx is saying, hey, we need to eliminate religion. We've got to get rid of theocracy and theology. We've got to create... You know, we got to bring everything down to earth. It's a very humanistic, secular perspective. So, you know, how fascinating that this is happening. And there's so many cool things you can explore between those two dichotomies. So, we also see the rise of this dragon. And the dragon is going to draw a third part of the stars of heaven. Okay, now how many stars are there? No? It's a trick question. There's 12. How many fall? We can actually quantify this. One third part of 12 is? Four. Four. Okay, Joseph has an interesting challenge now. Joseph has got to get four of the original 12 apostles to do what? <coughs> to leave. Can you imagine that? Hey, I called 12 of you. By the way, I need you four to leave. Is Joseph this smart? Watch what happens. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, here's the original 12 apostles. They're called on February 8, 1835. Eight of them leave the church. Four come back. Four never return. Four of the original 12 apostles, just like Revelation chapter 12 predicts, fall away from the church and never come back. Joseph still batted a thousand. It's amazing. Well, what does the book of Revelation say has to happen next then? The church 
has to bring forth the kingdom of God, whose right it is to rule all nations with a rule of iron. And then this child has to be caught up unto God in the throne of God. Okay, let's look at that. I thought I did the right thing and pulled that forward and I didn't. There we go, there it is. Okay, on the 11th of March, 1844, this is the front uh, cover of a book released by the church. Um, in the administrative records portion of the Joseph Smith papers, in which for the first time, you'll see that here, this is the inside jacket writing on that book. The minutes were recorded by Joseph's personal clerk, William Clayton, and they were never previously available until about 2020, when this volume was released. Also in this, on the very front jacket, you can also read about it more in the, it's a really thick book, so if you want to just skip that, you can see it here or go find the front cover. It says, on the 11th of March, 1844, in Nauvoo, Joseph organized a council that he and his associates saw as the beginning of the government of the literal kingdom of God on earth. The council was known both as the Council of the Kingdom of God and the Council of Fifty. Okay, so you see what's just happened now. Joseph is now fulfilling verse 5. What is required of Joseph next, according to verse 5? March 11, 1844, he establishes the kingdom with the right to rule all nations, and that council actually sustains Joseph <coughs> as king of the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, so what's he got to do next? He's got to die. How are you feeling about that if you're Joseph now? What happens next? Joseph is killed within three months of that organization. And Joseph is caught up unto God in his throne. Now a lot of people, I think, look at this and say, well, it doesn't say Joseph has to die. It says that the child, which would be the kingdom of God, has to be caught up. But guess what God does not work with? In the same way he works with intelligence. There are two things that exist, can never be created nor destroyed. Intelligence and matter, things to act and things to be acted upon. Does God deal primarily with things that need to be acted upon? Or does he like to interact with things that can act and use agency. So he doesn't give authority to inanimate objects. He gives authority to people. And so he needs Joseph. Because there is no other thing. There's people, right? So Joseph has to be caught up. What has to happen now? Go west. Now the church has to flee somewhere. Does the church flee after 1844? Mm-hmm. You know, look what happens. Okay, see, we're on this amazingly precise timeline that doesn't just tell you what's going to happen. It tells you year by year what is happening. If you can begin to master this timeline, guess what happens? As you see this timeline more and more perfectly, what would it do going forward? It would begin to reveal the future. Because if, if, Isaac, if Jacob and Isaiah are right, then God has laid everything out in Scripture from the end to the beginning. But notice what John does. John jumps from the restoration of the church and the kingdom to what? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's so obvious once you see it. You kind of have to go to the temple to know this. You don't have to. We teach it outside of it. But by going there, you're further instructed to see it more immediately. Who is that guy right there? Yeah. Adam. Adam. Okay, so Michael is in heaven what Adam is on earth. And so if Michael is the champion of the Lord in heaven, who shows up at this event in heaven to put the devil down, who would we expect to show up on earth? as the champion of the Lord to put the devil down. Mm -hmm. Adam, at what place? 
Adam on down. Adam on down. <coughs> you see, 